Welcome to 10 Minute Record Reviews, episode 196. This time we're going to talk about this wonderful record by Dr. Lonnie Smith, uh, Mama Whaler. This came out in 1971 on Kudu. It was actually the second ever release on Kudu, and this is a first pressing of that. There's Lonnie in his uh, really, frankly, excellent suit and hat. What to expect? Well, I guess to start with the first thing to know about Dr. Lonnie Smith is not to mix him up with the other Lonnie Smith, Lonnie Liston Smith, uh, who also is a jazz funk icon from the 1970s. But of the two, the doctor's music is much more closely grounded in R&B and soul, whereas Lonnie Liston Smith is much more influenced by his formative years spent with Pharaoh Sanders. His work often verges towards spiritual jazz or astral jazz or whatever you want to call it. The Doctor almost always makes you want to move your hips, and if you like your jazz with a serious groove, his catalog offers some really rewarding exploration. He sometimes verges even pretty close to disco towards the late 1970s, and this is one of the highlights of his early solo career. So Lonnie Smith was born in Lackawanna, New York in 1942. His family is quite musical. His mom introduced him to classical music, to gospel music, to jazz music. His first forays into musical entertainment were actually as a singer, and in the late 1950s, as a teenager, he joins a number of different singing groups, including the Teen Kings, which had Grover Washington Jr., with whom he'd work later, in fact, on this record, on saxophone. He had real facility on the keyboards, and noticing his talent, a local music store owner gives him his very first ever organ, which is a Hammond B3, classic sound. By the early 1960s, he's concentrating much more on the keyboards. He's still in the Buffalo area, playing a lot of R&B with different combos. And then in 1964, or thereabouts, depending on what you read, he moves to New York City. And there he hooks up with George Benson. Benson, who was a jazz guitarist, would go on to great fame in the 1970s, was at the time playing guitar in the soul jazz band of Jack McDuff. Jack McDuff, of course, was a fantastic Hammond player. Lonnie loved his sound, loved the sound of the group, and he used to come down to New York and see them play all the time gets to know George Benson, and Benson's talent, even at this stage, is really shining, and he's about to basically record his own material. And Smith comes to him and says, look, when you go out on your own, which is kind of inevitable, when you're forming a band, call me, and Benson does. So eventually they form a group called the George Benson Quartet, featuring Lonnie Smith. The group is signed to Columbia Records by John Hammond in 1966. They released two records under Benson's leadership, it's Uptown, the debut, and Cookbook. And then at this point, Lonnie decides to release his own solo record, also on Columbia. That record has the excellent title of Finger Lickin' Good Soul Organ, and it features Smith on Finger Lickin' Good Soul Organ, Benson on guitar, Ronnie Cuber on baritone sax, Marion Booker on drums, and Melvin Sparks on guitar. For his solo work in the next few years, that lineup would remain relatively stable. He also did some work as a sideman, most notably with Lou Donaldson, with whom he makes the great soul jazz record Alligator Boogaloo. Donaldson was a Blue Note artist, and that record, of course, came out on Blue Note. And Blue Note at the time were kind of in flux. They, of course, had made their name with all those wonderful Alfred Lyon-produced early 60s hard bop classics. But Lyon had retired in 1967. The market for hard bop was also a lot softer than it was. And Blue Note, sensing what a lot of people were sensing, was that the future was much more in music, which was a little more grounded in R&B, soul, and funk was trying to expand, was trying to cross over. And so Smith was an obvious pickup. So he signed to Blue Note. He signs a four record deal with them. And in 1969, 1970, he releases a total, well, ultimately of five records because one of them is released much later. Three studio records, including two with Lee Morgan, Think and Turning Point, and also two live albums, Move Your Hand, and then the one which is released much later, Live at Club Mozambique. Those live albums in particular are great. And if you like the sound of Cannonball and Nat Adderley when they played live around this point, or Donny Hathaway and his, frankly, amazing two live records from roughly the same period, then you really like those as well. Having finished his contract with Blue Note, he then follows George Benson to Creed Taylor's CTI label, where in 1971, he makes this record. Taylor, the famous producer, was pretty well regarded at this point as a jazz and pop talent spotter and tastemaker. Or, if you prefer, he was a relentless diluter and commercializer of jazz as an art form in the pursuit of sales. He'd cut his teeth in the 1950s at Bethlehem Records, which is a pretty well-known jazz label. He'd then been instrumental in the worldwide bossa nova craze, which happens in the early 1960s, primarily through his role as producer of two of the most foundational records of the time, Jazz Samba by Charlie Bird and Stan Getz, and then, of course, Getz's collaboration with Joao Gilberto, Astro Gilberto, and Antonio Carlos Jobim, Getz Gilberto, which comes out, I think, in 1964. 
Along that path, in 1960, he'd founded Impulse Records and put in place that label's philosophy of signing cutting-edge jazz performers and also having the striking cover art, which frankly still impresses today. Riding all of that success, in the later 1960s, he decides to found his own label, first kind of under the umbrella of A&M, Herb Alpert's label, called Creed Taylor International, and then eventually, I think in 1969, he takes it independent of A&M. If the work that Taylor did in the 1960s with Impulse, with Verve, and with A&M is pretty uncontroversially considered to be great, in the 1970s, it's a lot more divisive. And I get it, because the music he's producing in those years veers, certainly at the edges, away from jazz, towards soul, towards R&B, towards even easy listening. But I think Taylor understood that jazz, as it became, frankly, more extreme, more esoteric, almost more academic, and, and basically more niche, was losing its audience. Jazz had been, at one point, black pop music. It was no longer that. It had been completely replaced by all of the amazing music that was happening from Motown, Stax Records, later on from the Philly Sound, and so on. Jazz players knew this was happening. Taylor knew this was happening, and in order to reconnect with that audience, they had to move, and they had to cross over, and they had to blend, and that's very much what Taylor and the musicians he worked with achieved in the early part of the 1970s. This album was made July 14th and 15th, 1971, at Rudy Van Gelder's studio in Englewood Cliffs, New Jersey, with Creed Taylor producing. Lonnie Smith is on organ, clavinet, and vocals, and with him are a whole bunch of folks who really became just part of the whole CTI Kudu Records fabric and were regular session players. Those include Grover Washington Jr. on flute, on tenor saxophone, and he also does a number of the arrangements. The bass is shared by Ron Carter, of course, who's a veteran of working with Miles Davis, and also Chuck Rainey, who was another real rock in the studio for Taylor over the years. Billy Cobham is on drums. Erto Marrera is on percussion. Danny Moore, who's a longtime session guy for pretty much everybody in the 1970s and every label that was halfway cool, is on trumpet and flugelhorn. Lots of other people on here, but two others worth mentioning. First of all, Dave Hubbard on tenor sax. This is the only time he actually records with Dr. Lonnie Smith. He ends up going on to have quite a long career in the 70s with the other Lonnie Smith, Lonnie Listen Smith, as part of his group, The Cosmic Echoes. And finally, just because of the quality of the work he does here, a guy called Robert Lowe, who's a songwriter from Detroit, who adds a number of nice little guitar touches. Side one starts with Mama Whaler, which is fantastic track. This has got one of the best Latin beats that you'll ever hear, certainly when blended with a jazz sound, and it's very much channeling the whole boogaloo craze, which was very much infusing all of the New York, Latin, Cuban music scene around that time. There's a great solo from Grover, there's a great solo from Robert Lowe, and then Lonnie comes in and he's obviously playing organ, but at times he's also playing clavinet. I'm not quite sure whether he's playing one with one hand and one with the other, or whether it's overdubs, but in any event, this whole track is just a killer and frankly is reason enough to buy this record. Ola Mudica is next, another great piece of Latin jazz fusion, heavy on the soul. Last track inside one is I Feel the Earth Move, which of course is the Carole King classic track from her classic album, Tapestry. This is pretty much funked up beyond all recognition. Grover gets credit for the arrangement, which is a bit of a mixed blessing because I find the horns a little bit busy on this, and the organ, particularly in the higher registers, tends to overwhelm the rest of the music. That said, Lonnie's playing is fantastic. It's kind of like Reuben Wilson at his absolute best. But overall, this track kind of feels a little bit like the last track they needed to record just to fill out the record. The second side is entirely given over to a cover of Sly Stone's Stand, which had been a hit a year or two before. After they state the melody, then it breaks down to this really rich, funky groove, and in particular, Ron Carter's work on electric bass is just excellent. That's the first part of the song. Then about halfway through, we get into a much more kind of up-tempo, kind of pulsing beat. Lonnie is adding all kinds of different flavors and textures with his organ. It's a little bit almost like the whole lot of love freakout, only, sadly, without Theremin. The track stays pretty freaky, and like a lot of sidelong jams, it slightly unravels at the end, but still, it's a great album side. This record's got two brilliant tracks, one sidelong track with many great moments, and one track which feels like it needed a little more care and tending and attention before it was sent off to school. If you're a fan of Kudu Records and the phenomenal sound that Creed Taylor was able to assemble with all the wonderful musicians that he was able to keep around with that label, and there's no reason not to be a fan of that, then this is absolutely something to be on the shortlist for your collection. It's not perfect, but it's pretty hard to find a track which captures that musical moment of 1970 and that crossover from jazz into funk and soul jazz and so on better than the title track. I mean, really, it's one of the great, classic, delicious pieces for that period of time. And for that reason alone, I give this record four out of five stars.